Hey, um, it's the 36th District Democrats, and today we are interviewing Christiana Ope Sumner, uh, who is running for Seattle City Council District 5. Um, you can go ahead with your intro, or you, you can begin your intro, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Again, Christiana Obi Sumner, uh, running for Seattle City Council. I have I moved to Seattle in 2010 um, to go to Seattle University. Um, it was I have always been politically uh, active ever since I was a wee child, coming from a very politically active family. Um, I've always lived in District Five since I moved here. Everywhere between uh, 95th and Aurora to 145th and Aurora, and now here in Greenwood. The reason why I'm running for office is because in the last 13 plus years that I've been here, I have really uh, been a, a member of this community as an organizer, as a, a direct social service worker, as co-chair of the Seattle Disability and Renters Commission, um, as a student, as a renter, as a small business owner with my social equity uh, and policy advocacy business. And in all of that, in, in all of that experience, what I have seen um, is that we have a, a somewhat of a disconnect between knowing a thing and doing a thing. And what that has led to is needing to work towards upstream solutions for collective effective and downstream results. That's something that I have been doing consistently through my work, most notably as co chair the uh, Disabilities Commission, uh, leading one of the nation's first bans on sub minimum wage as co-chair of the Runners Commission, working towards the what would become the advance notice, six months advance notice for rent increases, as well as working towards um, uh, the uh, working on uh, advocating for a lift on the ban uh, of the cap for special education and working with over 250 businesses, government entities and organizations across the country. So this is the next natural towards um, continuing that life's work and that advocacy towards uh, social equity and policy. Um, thank you. Um, question um, one, I believe, uh, Barbara, this one was you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? So, um, Christiana, Given the increasing incidence of smoke and extreme heat events in the Seattle area, what are both short and long-term steps that the city can take to help keep its residents safe and comfortable during dangerous weather? Yeah, so the biggest issue that uh, we really need to address with the smoke and the extreme heat events is that we are talking about a climate disaster that um, we need to see that is based in the way that humans have interacted with our society and our ecology. And so there are multiple pathways toward the shared goal of addressing this issue. Uh, one of which, which has been a huge conversation here, is increasing our tree canopy and preserving not just mature trees, but also trees that are protected and, and um, by our indigenous communities. Um, we really need to really hold true to what it means to be in an urban forest, and that is a, a very long-term solution. We also need to make sure that we have cooling centers and spaces that folks can go to um, if they need to go and to have um, uh, to have refuge from the heat and the smoke, while also acknowledging that not everyone is able to leave their home or even their place of residence um, if they are disabled, if they are elderly, or they don't have transportation, which is going to mean that in our Green New Deal, in our comprehensive plan, um, in the public uh, development association and our building and maintaining social housing, we need to have green solutions for things like heat pumps, like um, air filters, for uh, and for really changing the way that our um, our society is set up, really ensuring that the building emissions and performance standards policy is put in place so that we can also shift how we are putting out those admissions. And we have to bring in racial and social equity and justice, knowing that the people who are most impacted by the effects of smoke and wildfires are going to be low-income folks, Indigenous folks, and Black folks, which leads to increased health issues, and that's going to lead to increased 
um, cost to our, to our public and to our society. So there are multifaceted areas that we need to address both short and long term. Thank you. I really Thank you. Um, so second question, um, um, Elks, why don't you go ahead with that one? Yeah, thank you for such a thoughtful answer. Uh, for the second question, um, economic projections show that the city will face a $250 million budget gap in 2025. What steps will you take as a council member to address that? Yeah, so we just saw that the uh, the report came out of the, the work group for what the progressive funding is, and there are very many of those that I agree with. I do believe that we need to also have a city level uh, tax and capital gains. Um, I believe that we need to have a tax on income inequality in businesses. I do believe that we need to increase the payroll jumpstart tax. Um, we need to really consider what a capital gains tax is, a real estate uh, excise tax. Um, but really, I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about in terms of the budget shortfall are a couple of things. Um, it's a both and piece, right? We need to increase the amount of revenue that we're bringing in or um, in looking at that taxes, but we also need to kind of balance our budget a little bit and make sure that what we are spending our things on are actually going to um, some progressive and transformative solutions for some of the issues that we have. Um, that's going to mean making sure that we are truly funding to the level of the crisis, especially in terms of social services, infrastructure, and housing, and making sure that our nonprofits and community organizations that are doing the work on the ground and have both the knowledge of the policy that's needed and the wisdom of the lived experience and the direct in interaction with those most intersectionally impacted are actually given the funds that they need to be as successful as possible and to help to actually move that progress forward. Uh, finally, we have to really think about, and what I would, I'm really excited to do as a city council member, is that, you know, borders are a construct. There's a lot of this stuff from all of the questions that are on here that is going to affect everyone across the land. And one of those things is the, is the sort of flat tax um, that we have. And, and the fact that we have the most regressive tax structure in the state, the most regressive uh, tax structure in the country as a state. And so uh, I think it is important to be uh, collaborating with all of those allies and those, uh, and those colleagues in the county and state level to see what we can pass, especially for progressive taxes and revenue. Thank you. Um, third question, um, Amanda. Yeah, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address this crisis? On top of us having a more most regressive tax structure, we also have one of the highest costs of living in the city, and uh, the housing stock that we have is not necessarily affordable. Uh, especially as a social service worker, one of the biggest difficulties was that well, as we have housing, affordable housing, that is based on federal guidelines around um, who is uh, qualified, it is not addressing the fact that we are living in a city where the top 20% um, makes 22 times more than the bottom 20% of income earners in the city. And yes, about, I would say uh, off the top of my head, about 75 to 80% of my clients between Compass Housing Alliance, DESC, and Harborview were workers. However, if you make $15 an hour, that is not going to make you the two and a half times the rent to be able to get a $1,700 one bedroom apartment. On top of that, if we wanna make sure that our housing is only a third of our income, we have to think of the entire piece. How has the uh, food costs been going up? The housing costs, the utilities costs, the cost of medicine. Um, all of these things go into what is creating this stop gap uh, to being able to resolve not just folks who are chronically homeless, but folks who are entering into homelessness, especially after the pandemic, when folks are losing their jobs, they are say some $20,000 behind on rent. And we have a, a support services that can only provide some couple thousand dollars. And we don't really have a way for folks to uh, become both a stable in housing and receive housing. So we really need to look at the full ecology of the picture, the full interconnectedness of this and address that. And my experience has been, we sort of hyper-focus on the, uh, the, uh, 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 the results and we try to make it the cause. And that really gets us off track, um, just as you know, we're, a launching a rocket and you're a couple of degrees off, you are not going to make it through the stratosphere. And that knowledge and wisdom is what I would bring to this role. 
Thank you. Um, uh, next question, um, Pat. Oh, oh I'm doing the fourth question. Oh, wait, no, sorry, Laura Marie, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's totally fine. Is my sound on all right for you? Thanks. Uh, Christiana, if elected, to which standing committees of the city council will you seek appointment? And what unique perspectives do you bring to the ongoing work of those communities? Yeah, when I was looking at this question, I thought it was, um, I kind of had a bit of a laugh with, about it with my partner, um, because as I have always felt, the committees, I feel like, are sort of mismatched in sort of what their areas of focus are and where they can really be grouped to have the most impact, that said. Um, the two groups that I if, uh, if I would sort of go for is either sustainability and renters' rights or public safety and human rights. I do feel like what I would hope and would love to see is say public assets go to housing or something like that, especially with the social housing PDA coming up and being able to really have those connected pieces um, so that we can ensure that uh, we're having conversations in space with each other where it makes sense. The sustainability and renters' rights, um, I think both my passion for climate justice as well as affordable housing for all and making sure that renters not only are able to maintain their space in place, um, that we're able to have housing for folks to become renters or even owners if possible, but to make sure that we are also thinking about all of the different areas of accessibility. As a multiply disabled person um, who is a renter, there are different factors of what it means to make sure that we're increasing our housing stock in a way that is actually going to be accessible. Uh, that has not really been considered. Say, if you have a fourplex, but you don't, but someone has to go upstairs, then if you are not able to go upstairs, that's not going to be a, a viable option. If you have a townhouse where your bedroom's on the second floor and you have a bad uh, body day, then you're not going to be able to get to your bedroom. When I was co-chair of the Seattle Renters Commission, I asked the codes and enforcement department what they do to make sure that housing stock is accessible, and they do not currently have a process in place for that. So making sure that we actually have a sustainable, a sustainable and accessible um, and affordable housing stock, I think for sustainability and renters' rights, a special degree New Deal would be where I would be best at. Yeah, thank you for that, you for, that. Uh, for that thoughtful thank answer. Um, uh, so now we're going to go on to our follow-on questions. So um, I guess, if, um, is there anybody who has a question uh, ready to ask? And these will have one minute answers. Okay. Okay, Amanda. Yeah, my question is a follow-up actually to number two uh, about the working group came back with some progressive revenue sources. But we've also um, heard some reaction against uh, revenue and looking at spending first. Um, and I'd love to hear how you would approach uh, bringing folks on board um, with raising revenue uh, as, in addition to as well as or whether you would look at spending before raising revenue. Yeah, I mean, I think it's both and. I mean, if you have a budget and you are seeing that you are not bringing in enough money, but also maybe you are like me and spend way too much money on Uber Eats or something like that, or a little bit too much on other things, then you have to both balance the budget and you have to raise progressive revenue. Really, at the end of the day, because we have one of the most regressive tax structures and revenue structures in the country, I think it is, it, it, it's, it's a obvious to me that we need to really look at how are we going to have a progressive revenue structure. And that is going to require advocacy and collaboration at the state level, yes, but part of being a city council member and amplifying the voices and leadership and needs of the people in your district is uh, also being someone who is going to not just see, oh, I just saw you think about the timer. It's to not just sort of uh, see barriers to where my purview ends and only work within that, but to see where those through lines are and have those conversations and those advocacy. And so uh, for, for, for me, it's gonna really be about 80% progressive revenue and about 20% balancing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, apologize for the distraction with the timer, but you did actually finish up in time. So um, we'll, we'll make sure that it's set for one minute next time. Uh, Toby, why don't you go ahead? Sure. My follow-up concerns uh, what you were saying about uh, low-income ho uh, housing, affordable to low-income folks. Um, you're going to be dealing with the comp plan 
and there's going to be a lot of pressure to upzone for developers. Do you think that developers should be required to provide low income housing on site in exchange for increased property value with the up zones? I will be honest, I think where I get hung up on that question is the increased property value pieces. Um, but where I, I do agree is that we do need to require the, the, the creation and development of affordable housing. Here's the issue, if we know, or at least right now what our understanding is, is that our issue with um, the, uh, the crisis around homelessness, around affordable housing and the housing stock is because we don't have it then if we don't create it, then we continue to not have it. Even if they're paying into a fund to build it later, we need it now. And so we need to be putting things in place that are going to um, very strongly encourage, I will use the word, to uh, ensure that we're actually increasing that stock of affordable and social and accessible housing. And if we um, continue to put it off because folks are a little worried or a little bit squirrely or they are unsure about having um, the sort of mixed development income, we're only perpetuating the issue. Thank you. Uh, Sherry. Hi. Um, I have a question about the current state of Seattle's drug use and possession laws. What, if any, changes would you make? Yeah, it's such a complicated issue, right? Because I think, first of all, especially um, in my family, I'm the first person to go to college. I come from a family who did street economy. I grew up in Philadelphia on the East Coast. I can tell you firsthand, as well as the data and statistics can tell you that the war on drugs did not work. Um, and so if we try to replicate that, um, I don't know how exactly it's going to be successful. However, I do believe that we need to do something. We can't do nothing. I do, I would like to go back to the conversation around public consumption sites. Um, which I think is an intermediary step towards how we can not have the sort of open air drug market that people are using, right? But also having actual places where folks can have social services, they can have support, they can have oversight, they can have access to what they need to be able to move them into housing, into stabilization, into treatment. And to also address the fact really quickly that it's a complicated issue. That when folks are going outside, my experience has been that they weren't becoming unhoused because they were having a chemical dependency issue. That happened because of the, the experience of being outside and the trauma of that. And so we need to have an upstream solution of what it means to make not only folks have housing, but also not go into being unhoused so that we can, and I think that would really truly uh, reduce the uh, drug crisis. Um, thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more. Um, um, I don't see anybody with their hand raised, so I guess I'll just jump in. Um, can you just uh, wrap up and uh, just um, give us a closing of a, yeah, just a closing statement? <laughs> Charlie, again, I want to thank you. I think one of the most difficult things about these processes is that these are really big, complex conversations that you're asking a major policy wonk to answer in two minutes. And so there's a lot of detail and nuance that I wish I could share with you. And obviously I can't as I see the clock is ticking. However, I want to share that the biggest thing that I want to emphasize that I would be bringing to this role is I have, as I said, going down that laundry list of the resume, the experience, the background, the uh, connections that I have in the knowledge of what it means to have the policy theory, to have the strategy, to put that through. I've been in that process. I've experienced it. I've consulted on it. I know that. And what I also bring is the wisdom of lived experience so that when we are putting these solutions and these investments in place, that we are not looking at it from a theoretical or philosophical perspective but we are really knowing how this is happening in actual reality on the ground in our community, in addition to all of the pieces that are needed to be a great council member in life. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, so I think that, um, I think with that, that uh, concludes the um, interview portion of the interview. Um, so we'll just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we can just go over, um, just sort of follow up and, um,